One of the newest Big 12 members brings their fantastic basketball program to Fort Worth this weekend. TCU in Houston. Parker Ainsworth is here. We're going to break it down. It's a Locked On crossover edition here on the Locked On Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. That's right, Locked On Horn Frogs, your team every day. I'm Stephen Simcox. Next to me is Parker Ainsworth, host of Locked On Cougs. Thank you for making Locked On Horn Frogs or Locked On Cougs your first listen. We're free and available wherever it is you get your podcast. And Parker, I wanted to start. We're going to get to basketball here in a second. But <laughs> we talked early in the football season because TCU Houston had like a weird conference game in the middle of the non-conference schedule. Yeah, yeah. And it was exciting. It was, you know, Cougars' first uh, Big 12 home game. Dana Holgerson was leading the charge. Dana, <laughs> yeah, Dana's, Dana's ushered out after the season. And, I mean, Willie Fritz is, like, not only one of the most well-respected guys in the industry. I, I made the joke uh, earlier this season. I said Willie Fritz is kind of like a hipster football coach. Like, when people want to sound really <laughs> smart – about who the, who one of the better coaches in the country is, they'll be like, "Oh, I really, I'm really into Willie Fritz." But that being said, like he's been at Tulane for a while, and he's had some opportunities. So, what do you think? Two part question: What do you think it was about the Houston job that kind of made this the right time? And uh, what are your expectations for him now leading the charge with uh, with this program? Yeah, I think the big thing for Houston was that it's a it's a power five job. So it's another step kind of up in the football world, but in the same region of the world that he's so familiar with. He's a very uh, south. He's very East Texas, Bayou, Louisiana region kind of guy. Um, he spent some time at Georgia Southern. He spent some time in the Midwest. I don't want to say he's been, never been anywhere else, but he's very familiar and comfortable in this region. Um I also think there's part of him that he's very much uh, an old school kind of you finish what you start kind of guy. And he wasn't going to leave Tulane until he got it to a good place. And he got Tulane to a pretty good spot, obviously, before hanging it up. Um, as far as expectations go, I, you know, I think we got a, a pretty solid coaching staff coming in with him. Uh, he managed to flip some recruiting stuff around pretty quickly in the couple weeks he's been here so far. Um, but it, it is a roster that needs a lot of work. You know, we saw last year, we saw last year literally in the TCU game that there's some trench work that needs to be done. Um, and it doesn't get easier when like Patrick Paul is going pro, right? Like the yeah, all everything left tackle, the the bright spot on the offensive line last year is turning pro. And best of luck to him, obviously. But so I, I'm not like saying we're going on feet or anything like that. I really do think though that they could be a a bowl win type, a bowl game type of team next year. Um, you know, bring him back down in Smith, but they also just brought in uh, Zion Chris, a kid from Louisiana. Uh, I guess I still say Louisiana Lafayette. I guess it's technically just Louisiana now. Yeah, that's pretty lame. They call it Louisiana <laughs> College now. Yeah, um, he's he's great. And I talked to uh, David Schultz from Locked On Sunbelt the other day about him on on my show. Um, and he's he's an electric speed type of athlete. Uh, so good competition there between those two guys for the starting spot. Um. Parker Jenkins, my guy, is the running back. I love that guy. He's spunky. He's fun on social media, and he is all about the city of Houston. Hard, hard to root against that guy. Um, so I think, I think, like I said, bowl is a very possible, very realistic possibility next season. Uh, add some electricity and fun to the season, because uh, frankly, coming off of last year, going four and eight, it, <laughs> it could have been really bad. <laughs> it could, it could have been really down, right? And so it's nice to have something to look forward to. Well, I, I don't like it, and so I think that's the <laughs> biggest compliment I can give you guys is that yeah, as yeah. someone who is in the conference and is going to compete against you, I was like, dang, that's a really like that's a really quality hire, and it feels like this is the type of league now where he could really thrive just with the two kind of recruiting behemoths leaving. I don't know. It just feels like this is the type of place where he could forge an identity and, and make it work. But, um, yeah, Houston fans. I'll tell you, I don't like it. So that's that's the best compliment <laughs> I can give you guys as as an opposing fan rating your hire. Uh, okay, so turn into hoops. And 
Houston had a really great start to the season. I mean, they're killing it. They're taking care of business. But they run into Hilton Coliseum this week, which is a tough place to play. Um, I mean, from a, I guess from a basketball standpoint, Parker, eliminating all of the kind of lazy narratives that sort of <laughs> come to the surface yeah, when yeah, something yeah. like this happens. What, what did you see? What went down in that ball game that led to a loss on the road? You know, uh, as far as nexus and those or a schematic thing, I think that uh, I, Iowa State plays with good length. Um, they, they play with good length on the perimeter. They start three, six, seven plus guys where Houston starts two. Uh, but I think the other, the other part, and we'll talk about Houston and TC matchup in a minute, but Houston also starts three traditional guard size guys, you know, the six, two range. And, and then I think really kind of got after them, especially when, Iowa State's a very defensive-minded basketball team and got after them with length in that way. I do think for what it's worth, like once Houston kind of got their composure, they were down 14-0 to start and had a lead in the final three minutes of the game, right? So like they they did come back and make an effort. Um, had they not had such a poor start, things might have gone their way, obviously. Um, but that that the length bothered them a lot more, and that's something that's hard to simulate, right? Um, right. I know like in football you talk about like getting ready for the triple option. We only practice it once a week. They practice it every week kind of stuff. Length is kind of the similar kind of thing. You can't like bring in longer players for practice to get ready for that game. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that was a challenge for sure. Um, it's obviously a tough place to play, uh, fairly chaotic weather and stuff, getting back and forth. And I don't mean to make those into excuses or anything like that. Like it just, it was a rough night. It was a rough night for sure. There are those all over this conference, in the big 12. I got to ask, I think he got hosed, but y'all had a rough night out the gates in the Big 12. Yeah, so I mean, going to Allen Fieldhouse is always uh, always an adventure. Now, I'll, I'll say this about that call. I still don't think it should have been a flagrant one. I have, it's been explained to me now, kind of the by the letter of the law, uh, Uday got that elbow thrown backwards, and he caught Hunter Dickinson in the mouth. I will warn Houston fans, Hunter Dickinson, fantastic player. <laughs> That's, this man will sell a call. I'll tell you what. Like he's got, <laughs> he's got this weird thing he does that I noticed where he'll make a shot and he'll come down the floor and he's kind of got like a European soccer clap. Like you know how European soccer players will like clap to the crowd. They'll kind of give yes, yes. He'll do that to the crowd as he's coming back down the floor. And this was full on. I mean, he got hit and he, and credit him. Like he, it was high, high IQ. But he fell backwards. He went on the ground. They stopped the action, which I think that was in looking back on it now, that seemed like the more egregious thing because TC was about to start a fast break. And I don't think they should have stopped play. Like there there wasn't really a reason other than him being on the court to to stop it mid mid play like that. It was so far behind the ball. I I, I coach high school basketball, right? And uh, so like that that's the part that irked me was like, okay, two shots in the ball whatever, but they were about to go get a dunk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, 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 like don't stop it. Right. Um, that, that was the part I think that irked me the most. Um, again, I also admittedly openly want to watch Kansas lose. Like, <laughs> like they're as Houston wants to compete for the top of the conference. It would have been nice to see someone give them an L early. Um, but y'all have a pretty talented basketball team on the season so far. I, I, like I, you, you give your guys a hard time, 12 and three, I, Houston's 14 and one like like and we're in the like it's hard to win college basketball games and winning over 10 games already is impressive um we got a lot of basketball talk to been going but did you expect that this year I expected the team to be good now there um there were a lot of people TCU fans I should say that were pretty optimistic about this group and sometimes I think Parker we just I don't know we get we like we get excited about a team, and then we start saying things that I'm like, I don't really know if that's true. But the the sort of buzzword about this group was they could be deeper than the last few Jamie Dixon teams that have been to the tournament. So those those obviously were really good clubs. You know, Mike Miles was leading the charge, but they were kind of top heavy in that they didn't have a lot coming off the bench, and so they brought in a number of transfers. Um, Jamie Nelson Jr. was kind of the the big name from Delaware. Also got Avery Anders from Oklahoma State, Ernest Uday from Kansas, Emmanuel Miller came back, and so I was I was optimistic that they could be a solid team. Now the the non conference schedule, in in typical fashion for 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 Jamie, was pretty weak. 
you know, it was, it was a lot of like uh, local schools um, that are coming in paycheck type games at home. <laughs> and they went and played in a couple tournaments and got, they got beat by Clemson and Nevada. They beat Georgetown on a buzzer beater. So I didn't really know how they were going to handle big 12 play coming into it. I, I thought, well, I think this team is talented, but it didn't really seem like they're meshing well. Um, but strangely enough, I think Jacoby Coles was who they kind of started the year as the guy they thought was going to be the focal point of this offense. And they're trying to run a lot of action for, with him. And then he got banged up and he's missed a few games and they've kind of been forced out of that to, to run out some weird lineups or some funky lineups. And I don't know, like Parker, I, I can't tell yet. I don't have enough of a sample size to say whether it's just catching people off guard and it's kind of like, a, you know, a novelty thing or if the team is actually better um, with what they're doing. But Avery Anderson and, and Nelson are playing together a lot. Um, they're running some three, four guard lineups out there. Emmanuel Miller has turned into a really reliable score for them. And so they've they've kind of caught their rhythm here. Um, and now they got a big test against against this Houston team. And I, I wanted to ask you about so what what's your response to the idea? You talked about you talked about briefly. So there's a lot of noise now. Okay, this is this is part of stepping up from the American to the Big Twelve, right? The the night in, night out grind. You lose to uh Iowa State, of course, Kansas lost to UCF the other night too. Um, but what what's kind of your response to this idea that I guess Houston's being welcomed to the to the league, so to speak? Well, you know, I'm not a fool. I, I do think Iowa State's a tough place to play, and I feel like I felt like going in. You, know, I think I said on my show, they're the kind of team where you see every year it feels like on Sports Center, Iowa State knocks off so and so because a the Big Twelve always has the so and sos, but B, it's also because they love basketball in the state of Iowa, and that's a big deal. Uh, they, they show up and sell out and all those those good things. Um, I, I felt somewhat vindicated when, after the game, I found out Houston was the seventh uh, top ten team to lose to Iowa State in the last two calendar years. Yeah. Um, and that makes me at least feel like it's not just us. There is something about playing that those guys at that place. I, I didn't have illusions that Houston was going to go undefeated. I, Kansas won the league at uh, 12 and five in conference play last year, but Iowa state themselves went nine and nine and made the tournament. I mean, this is a tough basketball conference, right? Yeah. I will say, I wish uh, we had a little bit more, uh, more friendly road games to start. I feel like Iowa state and TCU in the same week is a tough way to start. Uh, we later in the season, we'll have Kansas and Texas in the same week too. Uh, I, when the schedule drops, like we did not get any favors here, folks. Uh, that, that's no fun. No fun to start. It, it's not. It's not a fun. It's not a fun league. But, you know, I guess the flip side of that is hopefully I'll help you get ready for the tournament. We're going to break this game down more in depth here in a second. It's a locked on uh, crossover edition, locked on Cougs, locked on Horn Frogs, your team every day. All right, let's talk about FanDuel. Parker's got beef with FanDuel. Parker's a big <laughs> Houston fan. And Parker, you I mean, you're you're saying to the people here, look out for CJ Stroud and the Houston Texans in this matchup against the Browns, right? Yeah, my beef with them is that they still have Houston's two and a half point dog. Uh so FanDuel's got this great thing going on right now where if you place any five dollar bet, you get 150 back in bonus bets. That's right. It's a great deal with code locked on to so make sure you go do that L O C K E D O N. But man, a two and a half point dog at home in the playoffs, the first playoff games in 2019. I mean, the money line's at plus one away Houston's way as well. I I'm liking Houston's odds there. Man, I like Houston's odds too. I like what CJ Stroud is doing. So that game's going on. As Parker mentioned, FanDuel.com slash locked on. One $5 bet, $150 in bonus bets. I'll be focused on Cowboys Packers. Cowboys, seven-point favorites at home. The Dallas Cowboys in a playoff game. You saw Parker's face. You know what he thinks about that. <laughs> against a red-hot Packers team. But I will say Aaron Rodgers is not there anymore, so he can't hurt us. That's been a problem <laughs> in the past. We'll see if Dallas can do more against uh, Jordan Love. FanDuel also has an app that's safe and secure and easy to use, and you can, I mean, you can get as in the weeds with it as you, as you want. So you can just make the simple money line bets, bets against the spread, or you can put together some parlays. 
Uh, anything's kind of available there. FanDuel.com slash locked on or the FanDuel app. Go get those bonus bets and do it today. FanDuel, official betting partner of the NFL. So, uh, from a transfer perspective, they bring Houston brings in LJ Cryer, who I, I got familiar with at Baylor. Really smooth <laughs> player, really good scorer. Uh, how good has he been for this team so far, Parker? I I've loved having LJ Cryer. Um, I have to admit that I was not uh, skeptical is the wrong word because I trust the system that Houston's got, but I was surprised when he chose Houston. He's a Houston area kid, so maybe I shouldn't have been. He's from Katy. Um, but he is not known for being a defensive basketball player. He's a very offensive focused guy. That was the MO on him at Baylor. Uh, and for what it's worth, that reputation is accurate. He can shoot the lights up, uh, shooting almost 40% from three on the year and getting up eight of them a game. Uh, you know, for folks that are, aren't big into college basketball statistics, that's really hard to do. Right. And um, he, I mean, he's a, a lights out shooter. And frankly, you'd say that one of the reasons Houston lost Iowa State was because they had a great defensive game plan, put a lot of big guys on him to kind of get in his way and distract him a little bit from shooting. Um, LJ's defense, though, when I say mutually beneficial, has much improved from when I was trying to figure out who this kid was from Baylor last year. He's playing much better on that side of the ball. And frankly, credit to Kelvin Sampson, I think those first couple of games of the season when he wasn't or when they did their Australia trip over the summer, when he wasn't playing good defense, Kelvin Sampson pulled him. And, and he was like, listen, you don't get to go make shots if you're not keeping them from scoring. And I think that's helped him a lot. He's not a defensive mastermind. He's not going to win conference defensive player of the year or anything like that. But he's much better than I anticipated him being. And it's really helped us a lot. The backcourt now. So you got Cryer, who, as you said, is kind of an interesting, interesting fit because he is – no, I mean, he's, he was instant offensive Baylor. That was really his role. Um, and this, this Houston team is really good. Emmanuel Sharp there, too. Where do those guys, where's that duo kind of rank as far as good backcourts? I know you said they run a lot of three-guard looks, but where do those guys rank as far as great backcourts here in the nation? Now? Well, and you got Jamal Shedd bringing it up, and the three of those guys are, you know, Jamal is 6'1", Cryer is 6'1", and Sharp is 6'3". Sharp is long-armed and fairly stocky in build, and so I think he makes up for it a little bit, but... When you have guys that are that little, they've got to play fast and they've got to play together. And those guys seem to be always working in a different gear than the rest of the basketball, the rest of the guys on the floor. Um, they seem to be in fairly good sync. They're they're orchestrating their movements pretty well together. Um, but Sharp and Cryer both shoot the ball very well. Sharp, I mentioned Cryer shooting almost 40% from three. Sharp is shooting 37. The two of them space the ball the floor out so well because you have to respect them from behind the arc. It opens up a lot of the things on offense for Houston to do, um, which really kind of gives them freedom to drive and dish and drop to the big guys and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, they pull in other guys with the bench, too. Houston will play nine guys in a competitive basketball game, goes nine deep. Um, but that trio, those starting three guards, are really, really talented and really fun to watch play together. So Parker said he's he's a high, you're a high school basketball coach, correct? Parker, that's that's your your day job. Yeah, so I'm gonna I've I actually, I've coached football and basketball, but I'm I'm an assistant varsity basketball coach these days. Yeah. So when you watch Houston, because I mean they're known for their defense, they're known for cleaning up the glass, playing just great, kind of fundamentally sound basketball. The defensive side of the floor is that a schematic thing? Is that just an attitude? Is it a mix of both? Why do they excel so well? In, in defending teams? I think it is a mix of both. I think you see there is this uh, gritty mentality where they're diving on the floor for all the loose balls and making a lot of physical contact when the shot goes up, blocking out for rebounds and those kinds of things. But you also like schematics or culture or what have you. Like Kelvin Sampson makes a point to point out like they track a lot of statistics as far as just like very lay per like that you wouldn't keep track of. So they keep track of things like it's just on their bench and in their locker room, how many times your hands touch the ball on defense. So like deflections, tips, even if you don't secure the rebound, did you go for it? Make like those, those kinds of things are things they're keeping track of and like pumping guys up for doing well with. And they have some numbers they're trying to hit or whatever. They just, they value those kinds of things. And then they work at a very high speed. They're very, very fast and their rotations. They'll trap the post or, trap different spots on the floor depending on who they're playing and the backside rotation those kind of things like if we leave 
Steven, or if we leave Peavy, we won't leave Peavy, but if you leave Peavy to go cover somebody, yeah. the rotation to come cover that up is really, really quick and always on time. Um, and frankly, I know they lost Iowa State the other night. Iowa State's even the loss. Iowa State was scoring about 80, 85 points a game, and Houston held them to 57. Like, right. this game's going to be low scoring. <laughs> like, I, I don't mean to bur burst your fans' bubbles. It's going to be low scoring. <laughs> It's gonna be yeah. It's gonna be one of those like slow pace, plotted up kind of get get to you know not not the prettiest basketball in the world. But I mean, Houston has made made an art form of it, and they do it so well. So it should be fun to watch. Um, Parker, let's do keys to the game here in a second. But first, I know uh, if anybody's looking for tickets in the area, game time is the place to go. Parker's gonna tell you about game time here in a moment. Game time is a great place to look for tickets anywhere in Houston or Fort Worth, I'd imagine. I guess I hadn't looked for Fort Worth stuff myself, but wherever you're looking, uh, game time is a place to look because they have all kinds of great deals. You can look at different uh, you know, sections of the stadium and see exactly what the seats are going to look like and what your view is going to look like, obstructed, unobstructed, etc. They can get you tickets to comedy, theater, sports, anything going on in either one of our big cities, which is rare for a big college program. Both of us in big cities, actually. Yep. Um, whatever's going on, they've got the tickets. If you do this, they'll let you, like, if you just pick the section, say, I want to sit in section 115 or whatever, and let them pick their own seat, they'll do the hard work and you get an average of 18% savings. It's really, really a great, useful app. They do a great job making sure they find you the best prices so you can download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code locked on. For $20 off your first purchase, Stephen, $20 off your first purchase, terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on, L O C K E D O N, for $20 off. Download the game today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. All right, so we got a uh, we got a big matchup Houston and TCU, Saturday, 5 o'clock tip. Um, following the Iowa State loss, Parker, and just in general, when you kind of think about Houston and what they have to do to get a victory, what are what are some of your keys to this ball game? Well, I think that the interesting thing for Houston's going to be is how the first thing I would say is how do they do they defend Emmanuel Miller. Um, Emmanuel Miller is not necessarily a big name I knew when Houston joined the conference, but in getting ready for this game this week, I've very quickly gotten acquainted with that name because it feels like it's coming over the loudspeaker a lot every time TCU plays. He scores the basketball very well for them. Um, there's a number of different things around the rim, uh, finishes very well. And I feel like how Houston keeps him away from the basket is going to be important, right? I imagine he draws the Juwan, uh, Juwan Roberts matchup uh, as a forward, but I could be wrong on that. I imagine he gets Juwan, though, as far as starters versus starters go. Um, what's the most important thing? If you're thinking as a TCU person, what do they have to do to beat Houston – I mean, you just got a blueprint on Tuesday. So what are you looking at? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, and, and they've done a much better job protecting the basketball here lately, but not allow, you know, not allowing turnovers, protect, protecting the ball, protecting your possessions. And then I think it's going to be tough in this ball game because Houston does such a good job kind of controlling the pace. But TCU is at their most effective with their athleticism when they're able to get up and down the floor. So if there are transition opportunities, getting out there before the Houston defense gets set, getting some easy buckets, that's going to be huge. Um, Trey Tennyson is one of TCU's better shooters. He had a really good game against Kansas, struggled against Oklahoma. I think they were running him off the three-point line. They made a pretty concerted effort to be like, you're not going to get you know clean looks tonight. So I'm curious to see how Houston guards him. Um, and it should be a fun one, though, and I think, Whoever kind of dictates the pace of this ball game, which I know Houston is so good at doing that, is going to be or have the upper hand in this matchup for sure. Parker, do you have a prediction? Do you like if you want to go score, you can do that. If you <laughs> straight up, I I do think Houston comes back with a victory, and I, I'm sorry to spoil anything. Uh, I'm sure you'll say the same when I flip it in a second. <laughs> I think Houston wins. Um, I think that they get back on track offensively. They've played in a fairly tough road environment, so I think they'll be ready for that. Um, I think Houston wins. I'm going to say somewhere between 8 and 10 points. I'm looking at, like, we'll say 65 to 57, right? Somewhere in there. Again, I said it would be lower scoring than a lot of college games thus far this year. I'll say 65 
57 Houston. I imagine you're going to flip that around on me. I would feel much better about this if Houston just hadn't have lost a game. I think this team's going to come in highly motivated. I don't love that they're coming off a loss to Iowa State. Now, Shalemire Arena, they've they've improved the environment a lot. Like, TCU now has an actual home court advantage. When I was going to school there at the old DMC, that was definitely not what we were known for. Um, it's improved a lot, but it's not Hilton Coliseum. I think the, the students especially will be juiced up for this one and should be a good environment. I feel like it's a close ball game. My concern is I just don't love this matchup for the Frogs. I talked about those transition opportunities earlier. It's going to be tough to do that against the Cougs. So I, I think it's a closer ball game than, than you said. I feel like Houston wins by like four, and maybe that's with some tough dis- possessions down the stretch. Um, I would love to be wrong about that. But I feel like, you know, I said before, this is a tough stretch, Kansas, Oklahoma, Houston. And I was like, if you can, if you can find a way to go one and two in, that, in those first three games of Big 12 play and you're competitive in all those ball games, then uh, I will I will be pretty happy. So I that's kind of where I'm at right now, and you know we'll see. Uh, I'm sure Jamie's going to play this as motivation in the locker room this weekend for uh, for the guys to watch it. I got to ask about Jamie Dixon. Now I love coaching. Obviously, uh, it's my day job. I'm a big fan of Kelvin Sampson. Obviously, not just because of the Houston guy. He's a great basketball coach. Jamie has done a great job there in flipping this mm-hmm. thing around. You mentioned it wasn't like that when you were in school. Um, what what has stuck out to you about what he's done at TCU for, I guess he's been there seven or eight years now? Yeah, this is year eight. Um, I mean, I, I'm super impressed. You know, when – so when I was there, they were just coming out of the Mountain West. They were coming up to the Big 12. And it, it's hard to describe how bad it was. I mean, they were like a middle-of-the-road Mountain West team that was making that jump. It didn't go super well. Trenton Johnson, who I think is uh, – I think he's a really good dude and was very honest and – um I think he cared about the, the job and the program. I think he made it better, but it was it was just a big challenge. And then when he left, there were some rumors about Jamie. And my thought, Parker, was like, I know he's an alum, and he probably loves it here, but I just I don't think there's any way he's <laughs> going to take this job. But it kind of coincided perfectly because Pitt was ready. Pitt was sort of ready to move on from him. Um, I, I think that was kind of a mutual parting of ways. And he ended up here at TCU, and he actually flipped it over really quickly. Like the first season, they won the NIT. And then the next year, they had the tournament. And then they sort of went through a lull. And I remember uh, in the the COVID-shortened season, they missed the tournament in the NIT. It was the second year in a row they completely missed postseason. And I was sort of like, man, I don't know. Maybe this is plateaued. Like, maybe they need to go a different direction. I feel like he improved this thing. But now it it just sort of seems like it's in this steady stream of, of kind of mediocrity. And they hit the transfer portal really hard, and they kind of reworked this team. They built it around Mike Miles. Um, and now they've got a pretty consistently good program, which is uh, awesome to see. And, you know, they've made the tournament two straight years. They've won a couple tournament games for the first time in, in forever. And it's nice to have, you know, something between football and basketball or football and baseball that is <laughs> uh, enjoyable to watch, that's entertaining, and, and that's been consistent. I did Before we go, I wanted to ask you about – so. One of the 2024 recruits for the Frogs is Micah Robertson, who's now at Oak Hill Academy. But I know you spent some time coaching him early in his high school career. So what do you have to say about uh, him as a player and just as a person? Yeah, we got to coach Micah when he was a sophomore. Um, and we had him and, frankly, had a really talented team, him and a couple other Division One bound guys. And um, and then he went. He left us to go play at Oak Hill, and it was kind of thing where you know, it, you, oh, you see right on the wall. He's he's the kind of guy that if you told me he was a one and done future pro when I had him as a sophomore in high school, I I wouldn't have blinked. I mean that oh, he's wow. that build. He's six, and as a sophomore, I'd say he's six six. He might be six seven now. Very well filled out, big strong legs. I'd say easily over two hundred pounds. Um, the funny thing that year was. He got contacts mid year. Um, he got contacts mid year and suddenly became a very good shooter. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's funny how those th- kind of things work, but he's a crazy, uh, strong, explosive athlete. I mean, takes off with relative ease, like uh, puts his like chest up around the rim when he's doing it. Um, and I, I, I was impressed when he was a sophomore in high school and, they were like, you know, he's going to go to Oak Hill. He's really thinks he's got a shower. They were like, yeah, he does. It actually <laughs> says he's doing that. Um, offensively, he's great um, off the ball. I wouldn't. He's not like a, a bring the ball up kind of guard, but he's definitely a perimeter guy. 
Um, and he's very much the kind of guy that is like, he, he makes one or two to sit like footworky kind of shaky kind of things. And then just just downhill using his strength, getting to the rim, um, a strong, strong guy around the basket. Um, and then, you know, at Oak Hill, because they play a national schedule, it's fun to turn him on and watch him on TV. Sometimes he's, he's a fun guy to watch, uh, play defense. Now I think Oak Hill is playing this really crazy national schedule to play the Mont birds, the world and all those kinds of things. And, um, and it's fun to watch him play those Liam McNeely is those top guys across the country. Uh, because he seems to like really like the competition side of that. I, I, I was upset that he went to TCU because like now I kind of have to root against him for a hot second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can you can root against him in you know the the one one or two games he plays. Yeah, him. just once or twice, not. Great. <laughs> uh, Parker, where can people find you on social media, and then where can they find Locked On Cougs? Yeah, Locked On Cougs is wherever you get your podcast. It's uh, Cougs, I guess, with BYU and Washington State and stuff. We probably got to yeah. specify it. C-O-O-G-S. We spell it that way in Houston. Uh, on all social media, the X's, the Twitters, the, all those things, I'm Painsworth, 512, P-A-I-N-S, W-O-O-R-T-H, 512, like Parker Ainsworth, Painsworth. Um, wherever you're on social media. Steven, TCU is a fun mainstay in this conference now. Uh, I use them a lot as an example of what it's like to join the Big 12 because they did it a little over a decade ago. If people are looking for you and the TCU side of things, where can they find you at? Parker's a good follow on X. Give him a follow, Horn Frog fans. Um, you can find Locked On Horn Frogs wherever it is you get your podcast. I'm at Simcock Steven on Twitter. Uh, the show is at Locked On TCU. And Houston and TCU, Saturday afternoon, 5 p.m. Should be a fun one. It's Locked On Horn Frogs, Locked On Cougs, a crossover edition. It's your team, and we do it here every day.